In the first two parts of my creek ecosystem overview, we looked at the wildlife which can be found at the top and middle levels of a creek food chain. Continuing our journey down through the trophic levels, we are now arriving at the organisms at the bottom of a creek energy pyramid. Animals in this group are food for many organisms and may feed on others, which makes their existence imperative for the survival of the many predators which rely on them for energy. Throughout the upper levels of the ecosystem, we've seen plenty of organisms that rely on fish as a food source, but now it's time to talk about the scaly swimmers themselves. You can find many different species of fish in most creek systems, the most common varieties including panfish and creek chubs. Because these two varieties are nearly identical in terms of ecological niche, I am going to profile both at the same time. But to show them properly, I was going to have to do some fishing. On previous adventures, I had already captured creek chubs. There we go. That is a healthy North Carolina Creek Chub. But had yet to catch a panfish large enough to present. Luckily, I had the opportunity to do just that on a recent fall day. So what we're doing right now is we're just going to throw tiny little pieces of bread into the water. Hopefully, what we can do is attract some panfish. Once we have some activity, oh yeah, they're definitely there. Once we have some activity, some fish activity coming in, what we're gonna do is we're gonna bait up a special barbless hook that won't hurt the fish. We're gonna catch one and I'll show you uh, how they're different than the creek chubs. Oh, we got one. Nice. There you go. That is a perfect example of a sunfish. Now you notice that these are much more broad than the creek chubs were, okay? They're about the same length as the large creek chubs, but they are much, much more broad, all right? Also, these have significantly larger spikes. Now, you can definitely see that those spines could do some serious damage to any predator that grabbed it. And right now, if it were to flop around, it could very well stab me with those spines as well. So these spines are a very effective defense mechanism against predators. And anything that tries to grab this fish is going to get a mouthful of these little needle-like spines on the top. Now we're going to get this fish right back in the water. I just wanted to show you how pretty they are. And I wanted to show you that they are uh, quite a bit larger, especially width-wise, than the creek chubs. These fishes are omnivores, feeding on aquatic vegetation and small insects once they mature. The first and only strictly aquatic animals that I'm covering in this video, these are some of the easiest creatures to find due to their habitat restrictions. Both types of fish prefer hiding in deep pockets of slow-moving water along the fringes of a creek, where they can hide from their many predators and also forage for food. More often than not, they swim in schools, and can be found darting among the shadows as you walk through the creek. The main difference between these fish species are their size. Creek chubs in most sunfish usually attain lengths of 4 to 8 inches when fully grown, but sunfish can weigh over twice as much. This means that the predators of these animals are slightly different, with larger consumers such as a heron or snapping turtle preferring sunfish, but smaller predators such as snakes or bullfrogs hunting creek chubs more often. Filming these little guys was actually pretty fun. I would watch where school was traveling and go stand there perfectly still with my GoPro, feeding them tiny bits of bread. They would pay very little attention to me, darting around my legs no different than they would a natural part of their habitat. However, if I would have moved, they would have known. Fish are excellent at perceiving even the slightest vibrations in the water, and that is our main method of detecting prey or a potential predator. They can detect vibrations so well using a series of nerve endings running down their side, which store water and are therefore very sensitive to minute changes in their environment. Also, at the bottom part of the food chain are salamanders and small frog species. These amphibians, like the fish, 
are also extremely similar in ecological niche, and I will be discussing them at the same time. However, there are so many different species being shown in this video that I will not be doing creature facts for each one shown, because I would go crazy trying to make that many cards and you would fall asleep watching the video. Anyways, both creatures start out their life cycles as eggs, attached to leaves or sticks and slow moving or still water. They will hatch and undergo a metamorphosis, which involves several forms, until they reach their final stage. We see this final stage more often than the aquatic ones because they are larger and have the ability to travel on land. As amphibians, salamanders and frogs must keep their skin moist at all times, or risk serious health issues or even death. While the skin of other animals, including humans, keeps them from being dehydrated and protects their bodies from various harms, the skin of an amphibian does even more. The epidermic layer of frogs and salamanders is an essential part of their existence, and serves a variety of purposes including protecting from fungal and bacterial infections, providing excellent camouflage, and even absorbing oxygen from the water. When this sensitive organ is damaged by man-made insecticides, or infected by diseases carried by invasive species, the salamander or frog in question usually dies. That is why these creatures are considered indicator species, or an animal that indicates how healthy the ecosystem around it is. If there are healthy populations of these creatures within any aquatic habitat, it usually tells scientists that the water quality is acceptable and the food chain is balanced. All these small carnivores feed on aquatic insects. However, the world of insects is vast and quite incredible, so I will be making videos on the bugs themselves at a later time. The important thing to know about aquatic invertebrates is that they are the most basic protein source for salamanders, frogs, larger fish, and larger predatory bugs, so their presence or absence could mean life or death for any of those creatures. But what do the plethora of bugs, young frogs or salamanders, and newborn fish eat? Tiny, microscopic creatures called plankton. Plankton are divided into two categories, zooplankton and phytoplankton. Zooplankton can move themselves and are heterotrophic, or consume their food, while phytoplankton, also known as blue-green algae, are autotrophic, undergoing photosynthesis to gain energy. These truly amazing life forms are at the very bottom of any aquatic food chain, and are so minute that they cannot be seen by the naked eye. There are many different shapes and sizes of both types of plankton found in fresh water, which actually make up their own tiny food chain. Some zooplankton feed on phytoplankton, then these zooplankton are preyed on by larger individuals, until the largest plankton species will feed visible animals such as insects or fish. Scientists estimate that up to 80% of our Earth's oxygen comes from photosynthesis undergone by phytoplankton. Too large a quantity of certain nutrients can cause an explosion in the population of phytoplankton, namely nitrates and phosphates from sources such as lawn fertilizers or manure. This rapid increase in nutrients, called eutrophication, can cause an event known as an algae bloom. These events can cause serious and lasting damage to an aquatic ecosystem. The blooms not only prevent sunlight from permeating into the lower levels of water, Cyanobacteria that live with some phytoplankton species produce over 80 toxins which can damage marine and human life. That is why it's important that if you use such compounds on your yard or garden, you should try and limit or stop this behavior. While a temporary increase in the plant life that you use the fertilizers on will be seen, it comes at the cost of a permanent decrease in life in creeks and ponds where the chemicals will eventually end up. Well everybody, that just about concludes the Creek Ecosystem Overview. Together, we've learned about an array of amazing creatures such as herons, snakes, fish, and microscopic plankton that can be found in a local creek. I hope that you have been inspired to go exploring and find these animals for yourself. It will help protect these incredible ecosystems by limiting your use of things such as lawn fertilizer or insecticides, which will eventually make their way into the diet of creek wildlife. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to comment and tell me, and if not, let me know what I can improve on. 
Thank you all very much for your support, and have a wild day. This is Ben Zeno, of The Wild Report, signing out.